half of the library. Thanks very much for being part of all of this lecture series. Uh, this has been a big kick for us. It's been a big kick for the museum. Uh, uh, the, the sponsorship, the partnership with the library and the museum works really well. So it's, it's a great kickoff, and thanks very much. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about Red Irwin tonight. Um, uh, you know, every county in America has pilots. Everywhere, all across America has flyers. And, and people that are currently flying, people who've flown in service, and so forth. But not every county had a pioneer, and who was somebody who was there at the very start. And that's what we've got with Red Herb. Um, um, uh, Red was a bank customer at the Warner Bank when I started working there. Uh, uh, he was of my parents' generation. He was always perfectly nice to me when I waited on him. But it was only when I got my pilot's license that we really hit it off and we had something in common. Um, you know, like everybody, he and his wife are living out on the farm in Hallsville. This is family farm. This was Hooterville Airport. They're at the point that he's retired from aviation and, and his health's going down and they really can't live out in the country anymore. And, and he was in the bank one day and, and kind of said, uh, uh, Charlene and I have had a wonderful life in aviation and we've met a lot of wonderful people and, and we just can't live on the farm anymore. And we think you'd really be happy at Hooterville. And so that was kind of the way things got started. So uh, anyway, I moved out there. We get the deal struck and all that kind of stuff. And I moved to Hooterville. And, and Red is just tickled that there's going to be another generation flying there. I mean, he's just, he's just delighted to think that that's going to continue. So he leaves everything. <laughs> I mean everything. Uh, and, and now, now, like Nelson Thorpe kind of grew up at an airport with, with all of his family flying. Well, I didn't. And I'm moving to Hooterville thinking, oh, I'm moving into the house and that's that. Well, that'd be nice. No, I was moving to an airport. And, and there were, you know, manuals and photographs and flight gear and aircraft parts and tools and hardware. And it was an ongoing airport. Um, uh, so tonight, I'm just going to kind of go through the stories that he told me and, and some of the anecdotes that he, he shared with me um, and show you some of the photos and some of the things, a lot of the things that you'll see here around the room. Um, uh, and then I'll, every now and again, I'll throw in whatever information I can about the background. Uh, there are a lot of capable pilots in the room here this evening. Honestly, there are. And so all of you, if I forget something, or if I get the story wrong, jump in and help me, because I, you know, I don't remember all this stuff. Um, let's get the Irwins to Hallsville. There's the first thing. Um, okay, about 1900, uh, the Irwins, Reds, Parents, Wilbur, and Minnie are in Hallsville. Uh, Wilbur is the station master for the Illinois Central Railroad and that little freight station there in Hallsville. Uh, Minnie is a Hall. She's a descendant of the Hall family. So this is kind of a prominent family in Hallsville. Uh, Red told a really charming story about those freight stations. You know, he's in freight station and I'm thinking, oh yeah, sleepy little thing and, then, and a train comes in once a day and they unload one box. Right, gotcha. And, and he, he said, no, it was the train station. And he said, there, yeah, there was a freight area, but he said there was also a little waiting room and seats. And he said, you wanted to go to Chicago? If you lived right around Hallsville, you got on the train in Hallsville, you went to Springfield, you changed trains and went to Chicago. I mean, sounds pretty good. Um, small town, um, Red's parents are pretty well educated. They want Red to be educated. They want Red to be worldly. They're trying to raise him into something bigger than a, you know, a kid in a little farm town. And I mean, he described to me a lot of memories of being in Chicago and St. Louis when he was a kid. So you know, his dad's with the railroad. They could get passes. And they're making sure this kid sees the big city. And they're trying to make sure he has a big world. Uh, let's get Red into the air. Let's get Red into the air. Uh, Here's an article from the Clinton Journal, August 5th, 1920. 
Now we're talking 102 years ago. Small boys of sin. Vernell Irwin, son of Mr. and Mrs. W.H. Irwin, and Nathan Coons, son of Mr. and Mrs. Ed Coons of Hallsville, ages 11 and 12, respectively, took a ride in the airplane at the DeWitt County Fair yesterday. <laughs> the lads were very enthusiastic over their rides, Master Irwin declaring that all he needed for another ride was an invitation. So, Red's hooked. Red is hooked. Now, I grew up hearing about that fair. I grew up hearing about that biplane. I grew up about hearing about every detail of this, but not from Red. From my dad. Red and my dad were the same age. When Red's parents took him to the fair and paid for that plane ride, my grandparents took my dad to the fair and paid for the plane ride, and he got to have an aerobatics ride. Now with Red, the guy takes him up, takes Red up in the sky, and just rings him out. Throws him all over the sky. Upside down, sideways, loops, hammerheads, the works. You know. Red loves it. Give me more. Uh, takes my dad up, throws him all over the sky, upside down, hammerheads, loops, the whole nine yards. My dad is terrified. Uh, you know, it would always end the story saying, I couldn't wait to get back on the ground. Well, that seems to be, especially in those early days, we lost sight of all of that, because we're so familiar with aviation now. But that seems to be the reaction in those really early days, that either you caught the magic and you were entranced, or this was just too weird and you wanted no part of it. And, and so this comes up, Red told me these stories over and over, and these things come up over and over again, where you're either all the way in, or you don't want any part of it. Um, uh, oh, any of you that, that, so anyway, Red comes home and he's all ginned up about aviation. Uh, any of you that have been out to the exhibit have seen in that first display case uh, a biplane out of it, made out of a cigar box. Well, that thing's 100 years old. Red came home from the fair and made that airplane. And that was there at Hooterville when I moved in. So, I mean, th that kid was fired up. Um, uh, again, the family wants him to be educated. Uh, in the spring of 1927, he's in college. He's at the U of I. He's studying engineering. Lindbergh hops the Atlantic. Well, that's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And, and here again, this whole problem of either you're into it or not, you're not. The Red goes to see his advisor. Now, how can I transfer into aviation? The advisor is saying, don't do that. That's a waste of time. That's never going to amount to anything. No, 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 I'm serious. I really want to do this. No, no, no. You stay with engineering. Well, this goes on for a while. And of course, all that spring of after Lindbergh's, again, you know, across the Atlantic, the news media and the press doesn't die down. You know, there are more and more stories about aviation, more and more developments. And Red keeps going to his advisor, really, I want to make a transfer. And this advisor keeps saying, no, this is never going to amount to anything. It's a flash in the pan. Well, with that, Red drops out of school. He must have talked about this with his folks. I mean, they must have known that it was, it was coming. Um, uh, he drops out of school, and uh, his, his dad pays for his membership in the Bloomington Flying Club at the Bloomington Airport and pays for his first hour of flight instruction. So, you know, this is, this is, okay, 1920, he takes his plane ride. This is 28, so it's eight years later. You know, uh, Wilbur and Minnie have had, had eight years of that kid being all wound up about airplanes, so they know he's probably gonna do something with it. And he starts flying. Um, uh, takes flying lessons. Now, th this is a really important thing to remember. In those days, taking flying lessons was out of the ordinary. There were no regulations. Up until 1929, there were no regulations. You want, an air want to learn to fly an airplane? Go buy one and teach yourself. Nobody's stopping you. Uh, uh, maintenance? Oh, you can figure that out. Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, you could... You could just do about anything. Uh, no training was necessary. People tended to teach themselves. 
it was a real Wild West atmosphere. Um, uh, my mom's first husband was a flyer, and she always told me uh, as I was growing up that there was an old superstition that it was bad luck to have your picture taken prior to your first flight in a new airplane. <laughs> And I asked Red about that, and he said, oh yeah, that was true. Because for a lot of people, the first flight was also their last flight. <laughs> you know, and just, so they were just this bad reputation. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember the movie, oh gosh, this was 35 or 40 years ago, Out of Africa. And it was, it was Meryl Streep and Robert Redford, and she's, she's on this farm in Africa. And he comes flying in in this biplane. And of course, they're dramatizing this early day of aviation. And he gets out of the airplane and pretty much says to her, like my airplane, I bought it yesterday. And, 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 and he comes in and he makes this landing. And the pilot's in the room. Uh, uh, yeah, he makes a landing, but it's not one that inspires confidence by any means. And he says to her, you want to go for a ride? Well, she doesn't know any better. Yeah, sure, OK. And so you know, for the sake of America, they fly around. And, and, and uh, he comes back and makes a landing. And that's all, all part of the story. Well, the actual fact is this was all a true story. And he does take her for a ride and all that. That all works out. But among, about a month later, he kills himself. Because again, doesn't know enough and not enough training and no requirements to be trained or anything like that. So when Red's doing this, taking this, the, uh, uh, getting flight instruction, this is out of the ordinary. Um, uh, does anybody know the definition of a good landing? One you can walk away from. Anything you can walk away from. <laughs> uh, uh, definition of an excellent landing. Airplane for useful. Yeah, you get to use the airplane again. <laughs> so that, that's kind of that dark humor from the early days. Uh, uh, Clyde Cessna, <laughs> Cessna Aircraft Corporation. Uh, he's out in Kansas as a young guy. This is about 1918, 1920. He wants to learn to fly. Well, he buys an airplane and teaches himself. And he crashes over and over again and has to repair the airplane over and over again. And he teaches himself to fly, but along the way he learns how to build airplanes, and that's the beginning of Cessna Aviation Corporation. And it's all this, these guys just doing it by gosh and by God. Uh, nowadays, you've got to have a minimum of, a minimum of 10 hours before you solo. Uh, Red soloed after three hours. Um, uh, when he had 10 hours of flight time, and this was up at Bloomington at the airport, the instructor quit. Red was the high time pilot on the field, and they hire him as the next flight instructor. <laughs> um, uh, and again, I, you know, I, I, I just can't emphasize enough how different this was with no regulations, no requirements, nobody checking on what you're doing, anything like that. So he starts flying, uh, and in May of 1928, he makes his first landing in Hallsville. So there's Red in the middle. That's his mom, Minnie, on the one side. That's his dad, Wilbur, on the other side. That's the village of Hallsville. That's all the people from Hallsville. <laughs> they have never before seen an airplane. And so this is a big opportunity. Um, uh, let's see, what else can I tell you about the gen? Um, Liquid-cooled V8 engine. Uh, we used to have that engine in the radiator at Hooterville, uh, but then there's a guy over in Ohio who's restoring a gen in Oh, I kind of thought maybe he had more use for it than I did. So those things are over there. Um, uh, liquid cooled, flew about 75 miles an hour. Um, it, the engine was lubricated with castor oil. oil. And uh, Red said that, of course, as you're flying, the oil is blowing back all over it. He said, that's why pilots wore silk scarves. It was not to look cool. It was to wipe the oil off your goggles so you see where you're going. So anyway, he says, you know, the oil is blowing back all over you, and you're, you're inhaling it, and you're absorbing it through your skin. So, you know, about a week after flying that, you've got to lay off for two or three days because you've got diarrhea so bad that you don't have any business being in an airplane. Uh, so anyway, so these are, you know, he's flying, and he's instructing, and he's kind of buzzing around the neighborhood. Um, in 1929, the Civil Aviation Administration comes into existence. And that's the first regulation of airplanes. And it's because of people trying to teach themselves and crashing and killing themselves. 
and maintenance where you're just kind of figuring out as you're going along and airplanes falling out of the sky. And there comes this realization, we gotta get more training to people. We, we, we gotta get them more organized. So, 1929, Civil Aviation Administration comes into existence. Uh, Red is working at Bloomington, at the Bloomington Airport as an instructor. He gets a bundle in the mail from the CAA, Civil Aviation Administration. He's too busy to look at that stuff. I mean, he's 20 years old and he's busy, so he doesn't get that stuff looked at. So he's there at work one day and this guy shows up, uh, uh, and I'm from the CAA. And Red, and, oh, that's nice. And, and I'm here to give you your, your licensing right. Your licensing it's in. And Red looks really, well, what are you talking about? Well, didn't you get that stuff that I sent you in the mail? Well, yeah. Yeah, well, I didn't really look at it. Uh, well, well I, I'm here to give you your licensing exam. Haven't you been studying? And he flat out says to the guy, oh, I've been too busy teaching flight to study. <laughs> so the examiner gives him the test book, and he sits with the test book in his lap and completes the test, and then the guy stands out on the field, you know, and watches and Red makes three takeoffs and landings, and with that, he's a licensed pilot. <laughs> now, two weeks later, uh, over there behind Kathy, on the, uh, there's paperwork over uh, along the wall, and you'll be able to see his first certification and the letter from Joseph Noyes and the whole nine yards. Now, two weeks later, Noyes is in Kankakee with another student giving him a check ride, and he gets killed. So, it, it, I mean, all of it is the Wild West. And, and Red is kind of on the leading edge that he's had training, he's being taught, he's not having to figure it out. This is actually big stuff. Um, um, let me see here. So there's, there's that. Uh, okay, next airplane, another one that, that Red owned, a 1927 Wonka. Um, you can kind of see the, the way flight gear is emerging. Leather jacket, he's wearing jodhpurs, knee boots. Um, you know, kind of the cavalry idea, and we're taking it into the air. Um, uh, you know, a lot of this I just jotted down, things that Red was kind of telling me about. So let's talk about early aviation. Uh, there's no aeronautical charts. At the most, you use road maps. Uh, uh, navigate generally by landmarks. Uh, uh, you know, Red talked about following the iron compass following railroad tracks, following the concrete compass, following highways, following a blue line, a river, uh, navigating by landmarks. Um, towns in the Midwest put their names on the water towers so that pilots can swoop down and see where they are because there's not enough other physical landmarks. Uh, years ago, there was a, a gal from Massachusetts who was here in the Midwest, and she was visiting at Hooterville. She was a flight instructor. And uh, visiting at Hooterville, and there were a whole lot of pilots there. And, and we're all kind of saying to her, well, how do you navigate out there? There's all those mountains in the way, and you can't see where you're going or anything. And she's looking at us saying, how do you navigate around here? It's flat as a card table. You don't have anything to go by. I'd get lost all the time. So it's just, you know, it just depends on what you're used to. And, and as I say, in the early days, the towns put their, their names on the water towers. Um, uh, this is something I had to get used to. Red was explaining, in those days, there's no antennas. There's no smokestacks. There are no obstacles of any sort. Uh, for you other pilots, no reported traffic. <laughs> nobody. There's nobody else flying. So he said, consequently, seven or 800 feet above the ground was a whole lot of altitude. That was plenty. Well, yeah, that's fine if everything is going to okay. Now, uh, things are going to start happening fast. Uh, there's an old saying with aviation, there is safety in altitude. The higher up in the air you are, the more time you have to sort things out if you have a problem. <laughs> If you're down low, you know, it's happening fast. Anyway, so, so seven or 800 feet is, is, is cruising altitude. Um, you could operate anywhere. You could land anywhere. Uh, pastures were everywhere. Uh, Red said that there weren't a lot of concrete roads, mostly dirt roads, and that dirt roads were good roads. Those were pretty well. Um, uh, 
you have to remember, people were landing in fields. And, and so field, then you see, okay, now we go airfield. Then we get to airport. But even now, you will hear old timers referring to an airport as the field. And it goes back to that sense of just flying off a pasture. And if you ever have the opportunity at an air show to just walk around across the grounds in an airport, it feels like a big field. You, 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 you get a sense of it. Uh, uh, the, first, the first kind of developed airports were circular cinder landing fields. Uh, airplanes always take off and land into the wind. And with a circular field, well, just whichever way the wind was blowing, you could just line up and land. Uh, there used to be one outside of Chicago. There was a big apple orchard uh, outside of Chicago, and, and this is one of the first airports, big circular cinder landing field. And, and uh, uh, Red flew out of there many times, told me out of coming up out of, of, of orchard, this, this landing field near the apple orchard. Well, it's still there. And we know it as O'Hare Airport. And the three-letter ident, the identifier for O'Hare is O-R-D. And that goes back to the days when it was an apple orchard. That's the beginning of that. Um, uh, then he said the next thing was, was uh, after circles, was, was kind of octagons, concrete octagonal airports, where it looks like a big stop sign and it's just a runway aligned in every direction. Uh, now, I've seen one of those years ago down in southern Indiana. It just looked like a big big octagon from the air. Have any of you other flyers, any of you other pilots seen any of those old... Well, anyway, that was the next step of the octagon. Um, uh, Red was talking about flying at night around here. Um, first thing he said was it was black as coal. Uh, uh, he said that the you know the cities had lights, so Bloomington had lights, Clinton had lights, and so on and so. Forth. But in the 1920s, there wasn't any electrification out on the farms; they were still using coal lanterns. So he said you would see clusters of light at the towns, and everything else was black as black could be. Uh, he also said, of course, there's not a lot of highways, and so. And even where there are highways, there's not a lot of nighttime driving. So you just didn't have streams of cars. Uh, he said you did see the headlights from locomotives because there were more freight trains and more passenger trains, and those are things you saw. Uh, I was asking him, well, what would you do when you wanted to land at home? Oh, well, I'd buzz the house a couple of times, and my dad would come out with the Model A and shine the headlights down the pasture, and then I'd just come in and land. <laughs> so that was, you know, how that worked. Um, uh, so, okay. Um, here's the next airplane, uh, Travel Air 4000, and I think really this was probably Red's favorite. Uh, this was made by the Travel Air Corporation, that was composed of Walter Beach, Clyde Cessna, and Lloyd Steerman. Now, folks, those are three major names in aviation history. Walter Beach becomes Beechcraft. Clyde Cessna becomes Cessna Aircraft. Steerman becomes Steerman Aircraft Corporation, part of Boeing. So, I mean, these are, are like the granddaddies of aviation, and they are all business partners developing this, this a company. Um, uh, 300 horsepower engine, cruised about 105, climbed about 700 feet per minute, uh, a ceiling of 13,000 feet. Um, now, a lot of the pilots here have been up to 13,000 feet. Um, I've been up to 13,000 feet in an open airplane, and let me tell you, you get up there and look over the side and think, boy, it's a long way down. Uh, you know, it's just, wow, it's way up there. Um, uh, this aircraft survives, and it's down in Mississippi. Um, in fact, I got, a, I got in touch with the, the owner many years ago because I was kind of interested in trying to get it back to Hooterville. Uh, it is an airworthy right now, but it's repairable. And, and the guy that owns it is a rated aircraft mechanic, has his inspection authorization on the whole 90 yards, and he acted like he was going to get it back into the air. Uh, it sounded like it. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, oh, speaking of nighttime and flying, uh, there was a really, there's an early navigation system that was very close to here. Uh, uh, there was a system of lights between St. Louis and Chicago. Um, uh, these were spotlights. 
um, they were they were placed about 15 to 20 miles apart along the route. Um, this was for flying the mail. Uh, there was a, like a light in Lincoln, and then there was a light in Lawndale, and another one, oh gosh, up near Bloomington. And these things are shining straight up. Well, okay, think of a stark black background and these bright lights. Well, it would be like a white dotted line leading you from St. Louis to Chicago. And you just keep those lights off your left wing, you're on the way. And, and so that was an early system. Um, and that was known as flying the lights. Uh, Lindbergh had an accident, had to bail out up around Odell. He was following the mail. And it was sometime during bad weather, and the lights were obscured, and he'd gotten blown off course, and finally figured, I'm gonna run out of fuel, I gotta get out of this aircraft. But it was, he was flying the lights and got blown off course. Um, uh, the light that was in Lawndale, uh, 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 there was, used to be a mechanic that worked at Hooterville who was, had been friends with the light tender in Lawndale. And when the system went out of, of use, uh, Jim got the, the Lawndale light. And we had it at Hooterville for several years and wired it up and boy, it was bright. Uh, and it's down at Parks Aeronautical College in their museum now. Um, uh, dead stick landings, dead stick landings. That's when you're flying along and the engine stops while you're aloft and you've got to glide down and land. Uh, and the other pilots can tell, in the room can tell you. Um, boy, when that engine quits, it gets quiet. Fast. I mean, like, right now. Um, oh, there's a great movie. It's, it's old, too. Uh, the Spirit of St. Louis with, with Jimmy Stewart. And he's portraying uh, Charles Loomer. And there's one scene. He's crossing the Atlantic. Um, something happens, the engine stops, he's got cotton in his ears for sound deadening, and the engine stops, and he gets this really surprised look, and then first thing he does is pull the cotton there. He can't believe that he's not hearing that engine run. <laughs> and, and that's always your reaction. Oh, it's gotta be me, it can't be the airplane. Um, uh, anyway, so, dead stick landings. Um, one time, Red was flying to Chicago from here, uh, from Peterville, he left in the late afternoon. He knew that he would get into Chicago after dark, but he landed in, at night before, so that didn't seem to be a big deal. So he takes off, he's northbound. Now, in these days, there's no weather briefings. You, you don't call the FAA and get a, a report on what's going on. And he's, he can tell that he's fighting a headwind, and he's not covering the ground as fast as he thinks he's going to, and that means He's, he may not have enough fuel to get all the way to Chicago without having to stop. So, okay, he's he figured that out. And it gets darker, and it gets darker. Well, that's okay. He was prepared for that. Well, at about Pontiac, it starts getting foggy. And he starts losing visibility. And again, I'm, you know, I'm thinking like a modern pilot. Well, weren't you worried about hitting somebody? No. <laughs> you know, nobody else is up there. Uh, well, weren't you worried about hitting an antenna? No, uh, you know, none of that stuff. Uh, so he's flying along and flying along, and he's, as I say, about Pontiac, he runs into fog, and he keeps going, and I'm saying, well, well then what do you do? Well, he said, I kept going. Well, finally, he said, the fog got so thick he couldn't see the tips of the wings. <laughs> right, and, and I'm saying, well, what do you do? And he said, you stay on your altitude, you stay on your heading, and you hope that the weather clears on the other end. And that's it. So he's flying along, and just charging along in the clag, can't see anything, and the engine quits. Right. So, so he's, you know, 700 feet in the air, and the engine quits. Well, it, you know, it kind of lays the thing over at a bank and starts, starts a shallow turn, and he's kind of looking out over the side, see if he can see anything. And he gets about halfway around the turn, and it seems like it, there are kind of a glow coming up through the fog. And he keeps his turn, and again, he's got the thing banked over, and he's looking over the side. And he gets about three quarters of the way around, and these lights start to take the shape of an outline of a runway. And he glides down to through the fog. 
and the fog clears, and there below him is a lighted runway. And he glides in and lands, and it is midway, and they have just installed these lights, one of the first airports in the state to in install lights, and Red's a showman. He comes gliding in, dead stick, doesn't make a sound, rolls right up to the fuel depot, the line boy comes out, and Red hops out and says, fill her up. <laughs> and, and he would tell you, I did things that, that killed other people. Uh, I had more luck than I, you know, I used up more luck. And that was one of those stories. He said, you know, the good Lord was just looking out for me. And it just happened that this, this airport was right underneath him when he needed it. Uh, so that was, that was one of his stories. Um, Oh, another time, he's, he's up at the Orchard Field. He's up at that cinder field outside Chicago, and he buys a tank of gas, and he's flying home from Chicago, and he has seven dead stick landings between Chicago and Hooterman. Uh, he There's water in the gasoline. The gasoline is contaminated. He gets about 20 miles, and the engine quits. And he glides down and lands, and he said, I'd take the bowl off the carburetor and drain the bad fuel out, and then I'd pull the prop through until I got clean gasoline, then I'd get it started again, and then I'd get in the air, and I'd fly for 15 or 20 minutes, and the engine would quit, and I'd glide down and start all over again. And he did this seven times, and made it. Again, <laughs> lucky, just, just lucky, lucky, lucky. Um, <coughs> I'm trying to go fast here. Uh, when, he, when he gets these airplanes, you know, he flies them home to Hallsville. Uh, he doesn't have any place to park them. He taxis them right into the village of Hallsville and parks them next to his folks' house. Um, when he's refueling out in the field, especially after having contamination in the fuel, he's using a funnel with a chamois in it. Now, some of you all that have flown out and done any bush flying, Anybody here could talk about what, what the chamois does in the funnel? Chick, you have any experience with this? Yeah, the chamois will catch the water. And so this is a really basic, simple way of filtering the water out of gasoline. And this is still done bush flying in remote parts of the world. Um, now, I just wanted to give you this image. Put yourself back in 1928. Aviation is 25 years old. You've never done anything like this before. And you know this young guy in Hallsville, and he's doing this thing called flying, and he can take you up and introduce you to this world. And this is not something any other generation has ever seen or experienced. This is brand new. It must have seemed like magic. It would be like having the space shuttle pull up in your front yard. It must have seemed like magic. Um, you know, the, the giving rise, well, then that turns into stunt flying and barnstorming. Uh, here he is with, a, with that travel air, and he's flying for a Ford dealership, and they are advertising the new Ford with a Ford V8. And so Ford V8, they're underwriting the cost of it. Here he is in the same airplane. There's part of the F and part of the D for Ford. Um, let me see, where am I? Um, oh, uh, pranks. I, I talked about this, some of these things in the, in the catalog. Um, you know, a lot of people talked about seeing him flying along above of, of a freight train with his main landing gear resting on the roof of a boxcar. <laughs> I'm saw that a lot. Uh, my dad talked about seeing him circling the clock tower on the courthouse on the square and how he got so far into the square he was lower than the rooftops of the buildings around the square. Oh. Well, my dad talked about seeing him going down Main Street so low that cars pulled over to get out of his room. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's, no, but there's, there's a reason he had a reputation for being a wildcat. Um, uh, um, uh, oh, he, he bragged to me about making a dummy with a shirt and pants and stuffing him with newspapers and then flying over Clinton and doing a slow roll and letting the dummy fly out. <laughs> Now, 
Now this one is my personal favorite. Um, uh, you remember I, I mentioned that he said you could see the locomotives and you could see the headlights of trains? Okay. You're flying at night. You see way out ahead of you, four or five miles, um, a freight train snaking along, coming towards you, and they've got their headlight on. Oh boy, I do this. Um, you drop down to their altitude. You aim right for the locomotive. You turn on your landing line. They think another locomotive is coming. Uh, and Riz said, oh, you can see the sparks flying off the wheels. The engineer waving into the brakes trying to stop. And then just at the last minute, you turn out the landing light and swoop out the uh, You know, there were people that if they caught him, they would have killed him. Um, uh, uh, then he gets, uh, okay, let me keep going here. Um, oh, this is, this is another important thing to, to realize. Um, Aviators, we've lost sight of this, but aviators in those days were absolute rock stars. Uh, uh, you know, they're introducing the world to this whole other way of seeing and doing things. It's this new technology. It's, it's, it's unique. It's special. These guys were just cool. And in a way that we've lost sight of now. Uh, uh, you know, you can think of those girls as aviation groupies. <laughs> you know, uh, lots of stories of young women eloping with pilots in those days. The equivalent is running away with a rock star. It, it's, it's something that cool. Uh, uh, again, uh, you know, here's the magic that he's introducing to people. And here's what's so charming about all of this. Uh, just, just as a side, uh, here's Hallsville. This is Hooterville, there's the runway. Uh, when Red's flying into Hallsville, uh, you know, we think of Hooterville as, okay, a grass strip right there. Uh, in the early days, you could land anywhere. Sometimes he's landing right here. He talked about landing right by his, his parents' house all the time. Sometimes he lands over here at his uncle's house. Uh, there must have been something good on the north side of town because he talked about landing on the north side of the village most frequently. So it's, it's all over the place, wherever the conditions are right. Um, uh, talking about the celebrity status, uh, Lee Gelbaugh, uh, another guy from here in the area, uh, becomes famous as a, a test pilot and a flyer. He and Red are friends. These are photos taken at, at Hooterville. Uh, they, you know, they do all kinds of, of flying together and stunt flying and so forth. I brought this in. Here's this, this ad for Camel Cigarettes, and they're featuring Lee Gelbaugh. And again, you know, we see this nowadays with branding with celebrities and getting some brand associated with some celebrity. Well, think of the days when aviators were so cool that, that companies wanted to use them in branding and, and so forth. Uh, uh, you know, there's a real celebrity status to all of this. Um, speaking of celebrities, uh, um, Red knew a lot of them. He knew Charles Lindbergh, uh, said he was a really good flyer. Um, Jimmy Doolittle <coughs> said the guy could do everything. An excellent pilot, great business head, great public relations, uh, good in the military, just first rate all the way around. Um, uh, Amelia Earhart, I read something really interesting about her. Um, said she was a skilled pilot, said she was a surprisingly good looking woman in a kind of jaunty, uh, sporty kind of way. And he said the media really fell in love with her. And he kind of said she she got carried away with the publicity when she should have been working on her flying. And it, it sounds like the, one of those early cases of, of, you know, the media making a superstar out of somebody and giving them 15 or 20 minutes of fame and then we move on to the next superstar. And that was kind of his thought about Amelia, that, that the publicity carried her away. Um, he also knew Roscoe Turner. Does that name 
mean anything to anybody. Roscoe Turner was a, a flamboyant air racer. He ran the air, uh, main airport over in Indianapolis. He had his own kind of custom semi-military uniform and a handlebar mustache and stuff like that. And he had a lion cub named Gilmore. And he promoted the idea that he and Gilmore were flying all the time. Now, maybe some of you remember those old images for Gilmore gasoline. And it's, it's Gilmore and there's this surging lion. That was Gilmore the lion. And again, just like, like a camel using, using a Galba to identify their product, this oil company is trying to use Roscoe Turner to promote their gasoline. Well, Red knew it, and you know, you see these pictures of Roscoe with Gilmore, and, and they always have, have pictures of him standing in front of the airplane, so it looks like Roscoe rides with him. But you can tell, he's not putting a 500 pound lion in the back seat of an airplane, <laughs> but it sure looks good. Um, um, uh, uh, there's, a, there's an old saying with aviation, uh, there are old pilots and there are bold pilots, but there are no old, old pilots. <laughs> And that's something Red said after all this stunting. He said to me, I decided I wanted to be an old pilot. He's realizing I could get killed doing this stuff. So he goes to the Boeing School of Aeronautics out in California. He gets a master's degree in aviation engineering. And he gets a certificate as a master pilot. So he's, he's, he's getting this education. Um, oh, um, before that, um, uh, Red heard of a Ford Tri-Motor that was for sale in Southern Illinois for $1,200. Uh, and he went into the former Warner Bank and talked to my grandfather about getting a loan. And the Irwins had banked there for years, and Red's probably 20, 21, and he's going in to ask for $1,200. Well, in those days, a brand new Model A cost $400. So he's asking for three times the price of a car. And, and he talks to my grandfather, and as I say, the Irwins had always done business there, so I'd like to borrow some money. So my grandfather's, yeah, okay, okay. And, and I'm thinking $1,200. Well, uh, okay, well, let me think about this and tell me more. Well, and this is going to be for an airplane, and aviation is really going to amount to something, and this is going to be really big. And he said my grandfather tipped his head back and absolutely horse laughed <laughs> and said, no, it's not. <laughs> People are killing themselves. <laughs> Nobody's going to want to do this for recreation. They aren't going to travel. No. And so that was that. And, and again, I say that because it's another one of those examples of just either you got it or you didn't get it. Uh, uh, you know, and Red runs into this over and over and over. He gets it with his college advisor. No, this will never amount to anything. You know, he's you know, he either you got it or you didn't. Well, anyway, uh, uh, somehow or another, his dad gets the money and they buy the airplane and they fly it up from Southern Illinois. And again, he doesn't have any place to park it, so he taxied it into Hallsville and parks it next to his parents' house. And so there's you know there's this big airplane sitting there. Um, there's a traveler that was at the field. There's a, uh, a monocoupe that's a, a high-speed racing plane. Uh, Red owned that for a few years. Uh, it's still there. We're, it's down in Texas now. Um, let me keep going here, just real quick. Um, uh, after Boeing School of Aeronautics and so forth, Red goes to work for Eastern Airlines. This is in 1936. Eddie Rickenbacker, the former World War I ace, is president of Eastern Airlines. This is when airmen who came up through the system are running the airlines. And Eddie is a tough son of a bitch. I mean, he's just a hard driving guy. Uh, and, and Red is flying for him. He said in those days, this was early airlines. He said the public was still very uncomfortable about transportation by air. And if it got rainy or overcast, they would cancel their reservations. And he said, I flew the Newark to uh, Chicago to Newark route. And he said, I flew with an empty aircraft a lot because people would cancel their reservations. But Mr. Rickenbacker said, we are flying the routes. We are demonstrating that the routes are reliable. We're demonstrating that the aircraft are reliable. We're flying the routes. So he said, you know, it's empty, but I flew the routes. 
Uh, anyway, he he was telling me, you know, I got into these arguments with Eddie, and, and, uh, and I was arguing about this and that, and Charlene would interrupt and say, oh, he did, he did. I mean, she'd kind of roll his eyes like, oh, this husband of mine. Uh, hey, oh, he did. And she'd say, he'd, he'd be in there arguing, and Red's telling me, and I told Eddie, you can't fly these aircraft on this schedule at this maintenance interval. This won't work. You know, all this kind of stuff. And Charlene saying, I'd have to have dinner parties. And, and Red would, would sit next to Mrs. Rickenbacker, and I would sit next to Eddie, and at one point or another during the dinner, I'd say, you know, nobody else will argue with you but like Red will. And Eddie, you know, I'm sorry, you know. And, but that's because he's the only other guy here who cares as much about this airline as you do. And she said with that, he, yeah, I know. Yeah, you're right. I wish he wouldn't point his finger at me like that. <laughs> and, and, and things would kind of get going again for a little while. Well, you all know, uh, you know, if you're, you know, ma arguing with management is a dead end job. I mean, you know, management's, if you're not happy, management isn't going anyplace. You are. Uh, and so, sure enough, uh, Red leaves and he gets a job with Maine and Grand Oil Company. That's the, uh, the South American division of, of Gulf Oil Company. And he's down there in the, in the 40s uh, doing oil exploration, hauling pilots and crews to various sites where they're putting up oil rigs and so forth. Uh, the war comes along. Oil is critical to the war effort. Uh, Red gets an uh, exemption and continues to fly in South America because the production of oil is so important. Um, in the catalog I talked to him, he told me about his interview with, with Mana Grand. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up quick because we're going to take a long time. Um, he told about this interview with Mana Grand and he said there were two other candidates and I and they loaded us up in an airplane and flew us around the jungle, over the jungle in, in, in South America. And he said every now and again they'd point down, okay, we want you to land down there. And he said, you know, I looked at it, and maybe it was a little grass strip in the middle of nowhere, and he kind of, yeah, okay. And, and then they'd fly around, and we want you to land over here. And it's a trip, you know, a strip bounded by trees or something like that. And he's kind of saying, okay, give me the right airplane, I can get it out of there. And then they showed him another one where the runway's on a cliff, and you know, you can come in and land, but if you leave, you gotta fly off the cliff and let the airplane fall until you get airspeed. And you, you know. So the girl says, yeah, okay, I can do that. And, and, and uh, they get back to the main airport and the other two candidates have withdrawn their applications. <laughs> they don't even know So this is how the red starts and he's, he's flying there and doing, doing the kind of development work. And then it, um, I'm getting, getting myself a little too far ahead. Um, that kind of turns into um, um, running an airline, where where he's not just uh, flying flight crews around; he's scheduling the other airlines and so forth. Um, uh, oh, one story from South America. He said, one night my wife and I were just sitting down to dinner and the airport manager from the Caracas airport called and said, you better come down to the field. Uh, two of your pilots have just landed a DC-3 with the gear up. <laughs> and oh, and this is something that's important. Uh, the, you know, this, the exam, the, this guy from the airport says, two of your pilots. We nowadays say co-pilot, co-pilot, and it's all kind of one word. It's really co-pilot. It's a second pilot. Generally, I think the other pilots in the room here would agree. In, in a general way, a co-pilot is someone of equal or nearly equal ability who's up front sharing the workload. So it's two people sharing this workload. Anyway, so he said, sure enough, I drove down to the airport and there was this brand new DC-3 on its belly on the runway. And he said, well, the DC-3, and he said, both uh, co -pilot, the pilot and the co-pilot were standing in front of the aircraft with this kind of sheepish look on their faces, and he fired both of them right away. And he said, you know, so the DC-3 was a real pilot's airplane. Even when the gear is up, there's enough of the landing gear sticking out that the plane just kind of skidded along on its belly, and it didn't damage the aircraft. He said the propellers were wrapped around the engine cowlings. Of course, the engines are running when it struck the ground. And so they're just, you know. Um, but he said generally it didn't, it didn't damage the aircraft that much. And, and he said, I fired the two pilots just immediately. 
And he said, in the accident investigation, we learned that the two of them didn't get along with each other. And he said, this is late 50s, early 60s. And he said, all of Gulf aircraft had state-of-the-art autopilots. Now, by today's standards, they were primitive. But this was sophisticated stuff. And, and they learned that these two guys didn't get along with each other. And they had the aircraft on autopilot. And they were on the way into Caracas. And these two guys got into such an argument, they were in a fist fight rolling around on the floor of the cockpit. And the aircraft got to Caracas. Well, it didn't know any better. And it just sort of came in and went ahead and landed. You know, nobody told it not to. And, and of course, nobody was paying attention. And nobody lowered the landing gear. And so that was kind of that episode. Um, uh, uh, now, by, at this point, uh, uh, late 50s, early 60s, he's transferred to the United States. He's in Pittsburgh. Uh, he's, he's running the entire aviation uh, division of Gulf Oil Company. This is in the days when corporate aviation was its own airline. In a lot of ways, uh, Red comes to Pittsburgh, he's, he's promoted, he's going to run the whole thing. He becomes the Eddie Rickenbacker of, of uh, the Gulf Oil Company. In the, he's this old timer, he's this experienced pilot, and he's, he's running the operation. Um, and he told me at the time that, that he started the job, uh, he got the, the entire flight crews together, the, the pilots, the co-pilots, the maintenance personnel, everybody, and he introduced himself and said, now Golf has hired an expert to run this department. Now, okay, Mr. Earl. And do you all know what an expert is? No, Mr. Earl. A son of a bitch from out of town. <laughs> and, and so, okay. And, and, but, but it's really interesting. Uh, you know, his, his approach was, uh, you know, he's working with these people who are also in the profession of aviation. But they know that, that Red's an old timer and that he can do this stuff. And, and I mean, they definitely understand anything you can do, I can do better. They know the boss can do all this stuff. They like working for him. They like measuring up for it. They take pride in getting his approval. So there's a whole lot of elan and spirit in, in the aviation department at Gulf Oil when Red is running because he is this grand old man of aviation and this younger generation is measuring up. And they like it. Uh, near the time that he's going to get ready to retire, I don't know how this worked out, uh, Golf made the arrangements to restore a steerman for Red, and they were going to put their barnstorming chief pilot into this hot rod airplane and let him fly to air shows around the country and advertise Golf aviation products. So they took an airplane like this, there was an army trainer, and they customized it into this. And it went from a 220 horsepower engine to 450 horsepower. Uh, no cowling or anything. Cowling. Now in aviation, that's a speed rig. It cuts drag and makes you faster. Wheel pants to cut drag. Uh, a turtle back. This is kind of a hump back behind the pilot seat. So when you're doing aerobatics, you can stick your head against it and kind of you know, really stay glued into position. Um, inverted oil and fuel systems. So he could fly upside down as long as he wanted to. Um, a smoke system. So he could sky right. He could do it all. Um, so, they, I mean, they really made a hot run. This was well thought out. They even made sure they got the end number 811 Golf. So that every time you were on the radio, you were saying 811 Golf the Gulf products. I mean, this was all thought out. And what you realize is, basically, they're recreating for Red the plane that he liked so much when he was a kid. Big engine, stripes, all that kind of stuff. Um, so he kind of becomes the Red Baron of Hallsville. Uh, um, Bob and Pat Leggett. I mean, he goes back to his old tricks, the stuff that he did when he was younger. Uh, Bob and Pat Leggett were talking about coming home from, from Lincoln on, on a Sunday morning. And Red was out flying around in the biplane. And he must have recognized their car. And he swooped down behind them. This was on Route 10, and there wasn't any other traffic. And he swooped down behind them and touched the main wheels down on the highway behind them, then picked up the airplane 
and bounce the main wheels off the roof of the car. <laughs> then pick up the airplane and bounce the wheels off the highway in front of him. Then did a barrel roll and climb up. And Pat always said, if I had a gun, I would have shot. <laughs> um, uh, um, Carl Thorpe was telling me that years ago, when Thorpe's had a, um, a Beechcraft, Beechcraft Bonanza, he and, and Red flew to Iowa in this Bonanza. They were going to a flying farmer's convention or something. And Carl flew over. The deal was Carl was going to fly over and Red was going to fly back. Uh, and so they're there at this conference for the day. And by the, the time they leave in the afternoon, it's gotten hot and humid, you know, high density altitude, so the performance has gone way down. And, and at this point, Red's in the left seat, and Carl said there are these two big oak trees down at the departure end of the runway. And he said, it was apparent to me we weren't going to clear the trees. And so he said, we're rolling, and the aircraft breaks ground, and he said, I had no more than turned to Red and said, Red, we're not going to clear these trees. When within a wing's length of the ground, he rolls it to 90 degrees and flies it in between them. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, uh, so these were, you know, again, back to his old tricks. Um, uh, what he found out was that, that the world was different and the FAA didn't like that stuff anymore. And in the last few years, he was in trouble with the FAA a lot for all of his stunts and all of his foolishness. Uh, I've gone way too long here and I apologize. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, Nelson, could you talk about for a minute or two when when um, uh, Red put on impromptu air shows at Thorpe Seed Company? Well, my dad would talk to him coming over. Last day that you were deep at them, the folks he come to get to give you a ride. He said, you put it all. But this time, he came over and got red, and they came over with about 100 kids standing in the yard. They wouldn't, like, wouldn't let him go home. There come this big red steerman. He did a full acrobatic show for those kids. They clapped him, got in the cars, went home. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, it's all true. Uh, uh, and as uh, the whole point here is we're really lucky. Uh, as I said at the start, every county has flyers. Every county has flyers. But not everybody has a, has a, a, a guy like this who went all the way back to the beginning. So thank you all very much. And it's really been a pleasure having you.